What do you feel that the IOE can offer its students? Well, since I've come to the IOE Thumbjid, one of the things I've found that's been really good is that we have an extremely large number of academic staff. So we often get students who arrive, particularly at doctoral level, with ideas of what they want to do. But then those ideas change. And because we have so many people who are capable of supervising, people are able to follow their interests rather than feel they've had to commit themselves right at the very beginning. You're currently working in science education. Have you always worked in this field? Well, my own background is that after I finished my undergraduate degree, I did a PhD straight away in biology, population genetics, animal behavior, and then a postdoc. And then I trained to be a school teacher. And I taught in schools for five years and then moved back into higher education. So my main field has always been science education. Though, in fact, I also write academically in bioethics, questions to do with the morality of things like genetic engineering, and so forth. And I also edit an academic journal called Sex Education, which I've done for 11 years. So I do have doctoral students and I do work academically in sex education and bioethics, but the heart of it, and probably 80% of my work, is in science education. What's important about science education? The, the reason why I got interested in science education was first of all simply because I was a teacher in the field. Uh, worldwide, science education is extremely interesting because nearly always in school, science is one of the privileged subjects. Typically, along with mathematics and the indigenous main language. But what you find in the world is that in many countries uh, that are characterized as being quite highly developed, quite wealthy countries, most 15, 16 year olds, the age at which compulsory schooling comes to an end, they just want to drop science. The one exception quite often is either quite a lot of students enjoy carrying on with some of the biological sciences, and then there's a smaller group of boys that might enjoy carrying on with the physical sciences. But the average student, by the time they finish their compulsory education, is not enthusiastic about science, unless, rather ironically, they come from a country where schools generally have not got good science facilities schools that lack laboratories, schools that don't have science technicians. So one of my academic interests is looking, and you know this because you and I are working indeed on a project that's addressing part of this, is looking at why do so many young people choose not to continue with science or with mathematics after the compulsory phase of schooling. Michael, I know you've been involved in a wide range of research projects. Uh, in science education. Can you tell me a little bit more about your current project and why you're interested in that? Yeah. Well, one of the large current projects I'm working on, which as you know very well because you're working on it as well, uh, is uh, funded by the Economic and Social Research Council and it's looking at the four countries in the United Kingdom, England, Northern Ireland, Scotland and Wales, and it's trying to get to grips with why do some 15 or 16 year olds choose to continue with either maths or physics or both and why do others decide not to? And I found that the fact that we're now using a psychoanalytical framework to try and get to grips with what is it that causes some young people to see mathematics or physics as something that, as it were, fits in with their notions of themselves, is coherent with their identity, whereas others who are perfectly capable from their school qualifications of doing maths or physics, but frankly have to defend themselves by refusing ever to study those subjects subsequently. And although, as you and I know, it's fairly early days, it looks like the way that certainly mathematics is presented in schools is that it's a subject that people either see I can do or I can't do. There are few halfway measures and therefore, at some point, when the subject starts to get very difficult, instead of people finding, wow, this is actually quite challenging, I'm not following it all, but there's more to this than I'd realized, they seem to internalize it and suddenly feel, I'm no good. And that's probably, we think, isn't it, very different from how students understand the humanities subjects, which there was never, 
I could do all of it. It was more always I enjoy it, I find it attractive. And it's too early for us to make firm recommendations, but it might be that we need to present subjects like mathematics and physics in ways that don't cause young people to feel, I just can't do them, even when actually, of course, they can do 95% of them. They're exceptionally strong at them. One, one project I'd really like to know about, because it's uh, way before the time that we knew one another, yeah. uh, was a five-year project you did uh, following students. I had a series of short-term contracts when I left school teaching, which was a full-time job, permanent job, so I decided to set up a longitudinal study and I found a local school near to where I was working that I hadn't had contact with before and they were prepared to let me go in and watch a very large number of science lessons from the very first day when a group of 11 year olds in year seven, the first year of secondary schooling, came to do their science lessons and I was sitting at the back of the classroom as they came in and I was there five years later on the day when the students came in to get their what we call GCSE, General Certificate of Secondary Education results in science at the age of 16. And again, it's a bit of a common theme with me as you've gathered now. I was interested in why do some children want to carry on with science and others don't. And the message there was a much simpler one to give. This was a study done in the late 1990s. So in fact, I kept in touch with quite a lot of the students for another four or five years. And the problem, the reason why many students did not continue with science was fundamentally to do with the assessment system in this country. That many of them enjoyed science hugely, but the ones who were very good at science, some of them got put off it because the last year in particular of their schooling was just driven towards making certain that they got the top grade in the exam and therefore a lot of the interesting things didn't get done. And the ones who, to be honest, were never going to be quite so good in science, but just really enjoyed it, they really found an awful lot of the last year was rote learning, learning off by heart. So they could just get up to what in England is this magical level of grade C at GCSE, where many schools have targets. And this is a very common phenomenon in many countries of the world we're not in England the country that has, as it were, the highest emphasis on school examinations, though we are rapidly moving in that direction. Do you think, just talking about finding subjects satisfying mm. and the number of students that go on to do science, because you've spoken a lot about sciences, of course there's key differences between biology, chemistry and physics. Can you say a little bit more about that? Mm. Um, within the sciences, um, if you go back about um, 25 years in this country, interestingly enough, there were a very similar number of people who chose after the age of 16 to study advanced level biology, advanced level chemistry, and a fewer, I admit, in physics, but not vastly fewer. But what you found over the last 25 years is that the biology numbers have remained roughly constant. The chemistry numbers went down for about 15 years, but they've been going up for about 10 years. They haven't got back to where they, where they were, but they're not doing badly. The physics was a bit of a disaster. It halved in 20 years. And then a great deal of work was done by the government, by science educators, projects like that stimulating physics one you asked me about a bit earlier, to try and turn the corner. And we have begun very slowly to turn the corner. Most people, if one has to generalise, at school level, find biology easier to connect with because it's more to do themselves, their health, the environment and so on. Uh, but of course many people find that physics and chemistry mean much more to them. Do you feel that your experiences as a classroom teacher have fed into your work here at the Institute of Education as yeah. a science educator? Yeah, I mean for me they were crucial. I didn't realise at the time. but. Um, First of all, um, I am actually technically, although some people are surprised to know it, technically quite an introverted person in the sense that I'm absolutely content spending very long periods of time on my own and perfectly good at doing that. And um, while I enjoy the company of people, I don't, as it were, need social stimulation. So when I started teaching, I was not good at picking up cues from pupils about how interested they were 
whether they were learning or not. So my communication skills just improved immeasurably thanks to being a classroom teacher. There are also rather trivial things. I have a very good sense now of when 50 minutes is up because when you're a secondary teacher in England, that was the standard uh, unit of time then. It varies a bit from school to school. Sometimes it's 40 minutes or 45 minutes. But uh, it does mean I get very good at structuring things. And the other nice thing is if you've survived, as in my case, just five years of school science teaching, the amount of work you ever have to do marking subsequently or preparing for teaching in higher education just, just doesn't seem to be much of an issue at all because uh, when you're teaching as a teacher, every evening seems to be full of either preparing for the next day's teaching or marking the work once collected in. Thank you very much, Michael, for the interview. Uh, I very much enjoyed it. That's, that's good of you to say so, Thumjit. And I think actually it's really useful because you bring a particular perspective, being both somebody who's worked here for 11, 12, 13 years, and also somebody who's doing a doctorate here. So thank you, Thumjit.